So he's going to talk about RxJS, which is uh, reactive extensions for JavaScript. <laughs> That's funny enough, I might do that all night instead. <laughs> Thing working, this thing on? Yeah. All right, so as you said, I'm Ben Lesh. I work for Netflix in the uh, Edge Tools and Insights team. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at, at Ben Lesh, boost my ego, tell me why my talk was horrible, whatever you're going to do. Um, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about observables, not just RX in general, but uh, um, observables in general. The reason you should care about observables right now is that. Uh, there is a TC39 proposal to add them to ES2016 or ES7. I always get those, those numbers all jacked around since they've been changing it. Uh, Angular 2 will, will, it uses them and supports them in a first class way. Uh, React.js will uh, use them and support them in a first class way. And you can ask me about Ember after. Um, I can go into that a little bit. Uh, but to, to jump back from that quick high level, uh, <coughs> front end development. Um, when you think about it is, it, is it mostly synchronous or is it mostly asynchronous? Uh, well, we tend to think about code synchronously. So when we're writing code, we write it top to bottom, left to right. A lot of if this, then this, else this, right? And it's really easy, easy to reason about things in that way. But the truth is, what are we doing with it? We're, we're handling user input, uh, animations, we're sending AJAX requests, we're getting WebSocket stuff in. Uh, we're also up updating the DOM. So, out of these things, and there's, there's more, but th these are the big examples. Out of these things, almost all of these things are asynchronous, <laughs> right? So it's, it, you're reasoning about things in a, in a synchronous way and doing asynchronous things all day. And what does async usually look like in JavaScript? Uh, async in, in JavaScript um, looks a lot like this. You have some function you're assigning to, to handle some event. So in this case, we're adding an event listener to a button. This is going to be called zero to n times. Either someone clicks the button or they don't. They could click it a million times. They could set up a robot that clicks it until the end of time if they want, right? Um, it's, and you get these, that, that function E that you see up, up in the, this doesn't work on that, okay? Um, the, the function E that you see, that, that's a value I'm getting back. That's, a, that's a, an emitted value from that event. So zero to n things. Well, asynchronous values, right? They, they can be re represented as collections. Uh, well, what do we have for collections today? We have iterables. Uh, I think we're all familiar with iterables, arrays, uh, strings, uh, typed arrays, map sets. Those are all iterable right now. Uh, they work a little bit like this. You have an iterable. You, you call the iterator um, method on it, and you get an iterator back. Then you call next on your iterator, and it gives you a value. Every time you call next, you say, give me a value, and it gives you another one. Give me a value, and it gives you another one. This is useful for collections. However, asynchronous things have this time element that we care about. This isn't very good for time. This isn't going to tell you when your iterable has a new value. You have to, you have to pull it or, or something like that to, to know. So what can we do? Well, we can have an observable. An observable is basically an iterable pulled inside out. So instead of having, and I'm going to jump back real quick, so instead of having this iterator function that returns an iterator, we have an observer function that accepts an observer. And instead of having a next function we call on the iterator to get a value out, we have a next function that we give to our observer that, that we get a values emitted to us through. So this is, this is kind of what it, what it would look like. Now this isn't exactly what RxJS2 looks like, which is the current version of RxJS. That looks a little bit more like this. Very, very similar. Um, the, the, we're creating an observer, an observer, and we're passing to it our next function as the first argument. Then we, instead of having an observer function on our observable, we have a subscribe function we're giving our observer. So now my observer will emit values into this, or my observable will emit values into this observer. Now this can be shortened down to look like this. So now instead of declaring an observer first, I can just pass it this success function, this next function that will be called every time my observable emits a value. Well, what about error handling? Easy enough. There's a second argument for an error. So this is the error path. If there's an error with my observable, this will be called once. 
Um, but this should look fairly familiar. I think we've all used a promise. Who, who here has used promises before? Everyone and everyone else that doesn't want to raise their hands at a function, that's cool. Um, I think uh, we, most, of, most of us have used promises. Promises have a very similar thing that then with a success function and an error function. It's, it's basically the same thing. The only major difference is that in my observable, my success function could be called more than once. So we need to know when this is done successfully. Add one more of the complete function on the end. So this is the basic signature of how you could subscribe to an observable. A lot of the examples I'm showing today are just showing the success path. Um, it's the happy path, it's the quickest example. I have a lot to talk about in a 20, 30 minute period. So I'm gonna gloss over some of this. You can ask me questions afterwards or on Twitter or email, whatever you choose. So back to observables, there, there are any number of values over any amount of time. It could be arrays, which are a, a, a number of values that you represent over a relatively instant amount of time. Or it could be events from a web socket or mouse input or what have you. All can be represented with observables. So what? So congratulations, I just took asynchronous code and made it into a collection of things. I've, I've made this lovely abstraction. What can I do with uh, it? Well, it's actually, it's actually pretty cool because you can do uh, set operations with this. You can do your map and reduce and filter, which we just talked about, uh, as well as other things that you might be familiar with from uh, libraries like Lodash or Underscore, where you can zip or flatten, flat map, take, skip from these collections. But now, now they're not just arrays, these are actually events that you're able to operate on this way. So there's also a, a temporal nature, that time matters with these, so we have additional uh, set operations that where, where we can use asynchronicity to, to get different behaviors like buffering over time, or a window which is very similar to a buff, buffer, combining the latest values from two different observables. Uh, so there's some really interesting things you can do. So is everyone confused yet? We're good. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to jump to a code example. Forgive the transition here. So my code example is not it. The typical boring autocomplete example, we've all seen, ooh, it's not running, it's not running. All right. So this is the example that comes up in every RX at, uh, JS demonstration app, uh, autocomplete example. And, and it basically looks like this. I made mine a little fancier because I, I have a spinner. But I can type something, get a little spinner, get some async results back that give me my next value. I've added a, an artificial delay here so you can kind of see that occur. Uh, what, what's happening with this code? Well, what I did is I actually selected my input element, uh, the, the HTML just looks like this. I've got an input, I've got some results, so you all here where I'm outputting some results. And what I've done is I've selected my input and I've created a stream of key up events from my input, which is Q. And I'm throttling it, so I'm saying only get past this point if I haven't typed something in the last 500 milliseconds. So that way it doesn't just keep spamming my server over and over again with these Ajax requests that we're about to do. Then I'm saying, okay, let's map all these, these events to the value from my, my uh, selected <coughs> input. So now I've got a stream of values from my input. Every, every time it, it calls, it's going to, it's going to give me a, a value from that. Here, I'm creating a side effect. I'm saying, all right, at this point, go ahead and add a spinner class to my input. So I display that little spinny thing that, that lets people know that something's actually happening. And now I'm doing a flat map latest, and I'll get to why the, the flat map latest is important in just a second, where I'm taking my query, which is just the value I've gotten from my input, and I am passing it to this Ajax um, observable, and uh, I'm flat mapping it back out to the same stream. So when this is done, I'm creating another side effect to remove the spinner class because I've gotten my results back. And I'm getting the response out, which is just the object that was returned. And here I'm doing some fanciness with reduce. So well, one thing real quick, is everybody here familiar with arrow functions? I'm going to be showing this a lot. So arrow functions, just so people know, when you see this, 
That is the equivalent of an anonymous function. So it would be the same as we <coughs> type in function, HTML, result. Uh, closing that out, if I can type. And returning whatever I've got in here. This is, this is an ES6 template string. So this is the same as me concatenating HTML and result into a string. So, so now I've got this HTML. And in my very last step, si uh, subscribe, I'm creating one more side effect where I'm saying, OK, update results list, which was here, this, this guy, I selected it earlier, with that HTML. So set the inner HTML to that. So that, that's actually how this is happening. Now, why is flat map latest cool? Flat map latest is very interesting. Because if I, the, I've, I've artificially added a one second delay to my Ajax request. So if anyone's ever done this with promises before, a lot of Ajax libraries use promises. And the thing about promises is this. Once they start, they're not going to stop. Unless you are using a cancelable promise library, and I'm not even going to get into that. I, I've got opinions about that that won't be shared. Um, you, you, you can't really cancel this. Where, where I can now abort my Ajax request that, that's being managed by an observable if I happen to type again before that one second delay comes back. So if you watch over here in this, uh, in this network, you'll see if I type AP, you'll see my network request goes out, status 200, I got it back, it popped up here. If I start to type and then I type something again before it finishes, I've actually canceled my request. So that's not being handled. If you try to do this with uh, your common like jQuery Ajax request that's returning to your promise, that would not happen. It would just allow that Ajax request to complete, then its success function would fire, and you'd have to do some mental math to figure out which one you cared about. Especially if maybe the first request is much slower than the second request, so maybe it arrives, arrives after the second request. Um, flat map latest prevents that. This is, this is the, the typical boring example of, um, why is that running off the screen? Hmm of autocomplete. That's really weird. Oh, you know what I did? Ha ha ha. I zoomed in. Um, you'll, you'll find this autocomplete example seriously in like every demo of RxJS, probably ever. All right. Back to the talk. So we've got our uh, confused Mark Wahlberg here. Observables for collections. Uh, but. I have arrays and iterables, right? So it's, it's, observables are interesting for collections of asynchronous things, but why would I even bother to use them for something like arrays? We just had a, we just listened to a talk. It was wonderful, all about uh, map, filter, reduce, and these other, these other uh, higher order <coughs> functions for arrays. Well, uh, let me tell you a story about Demo Day at Netflix. So this, this app here, you'll see that all the numbers are blurred out. Uh, that's because it's redacted, because I can't tell you what we were getting in requests or whatever that day. At Netflix. This is the app that I work on. This is a real-time dashboard uh, that's, that we get streaming information in for all of the events that happen in the Netflix cloud. So it's much more than just this screen, but one thing you should know is that every single one of these graphs has a data stream backing it, and we're getting these huge arrays in, and we're mapping them and filtering them and doing other higher order. Initially, we were, we were doing it this way to, to get uh, down to these paths, reducing down to these paths, and to get other bits of information like the extents, like how uh, the min and max y values that we cared about and things like that. So the initial pass, we were just getting these values over the WebSocket and we were using these array higher order functions of map, filter, and reduce. And we were doing this against uh, our test environment which mirrors production enough that we thought it should be okay. So demo day comes along and we hook it up to uh, the production data. And it was a lot like this. <coughs> That's, that's, I think, me, some members of my team escape. So what happened? Uh, it was too much array map filter reduce. Uh, the reason that a, too much array map filter reduce is a problem is at each step, uh, as we pointed out in the last talk, uh, you iterate over arrays, you create new arrays, and all of those newly created arrays need to be garbage collected at some point, which also happens on the same thread. Now you saw how busy that recording was. I had mouse over actions happening, so 
if I'm using that thread that's also managing all my mouse overs and stuff, the, the screen just going to lock up. It's going to be very noticeable that, that all of this is going on. So an illustration of what this looks like, I put this together with D3 and you know, recorded it, is I'm filtering out my red circles, I'm mapping them to squares, and then I'm going to reduce them to a stack. So this is with array functions. So you see my, at the top, you'll see array, my array of items that I'm filtering and mapping and reducing. And in the middle, you'll notice I've got two additional arrays that I've created. Now, I not only did I create them, I've, I've iterated over them, and now I have to garbage collect those things. I'm not even using it, right? So how, do, how, do, how does RxJS save me from this? Stream processing. So with stream processing on observables, you have a, a situation where the data is only iterated once. So it's using like a transducer uh, sort, of, sort of way of, of dealing with these things. Um, there are no intermediary arrays uh, created, so there's less garbage collection. And what that actually looks like is more like this. So I'm still filtering out my red circles, but I'm immediately mapping it to a square and reducing it. So you'll see it's, it's only going through it one time, and I'm already done. Uh, I did this with D3 and I made sure that the measurements between my steps were identical. If you put these next to each other to drag race, you'll see it even gets done faster because there's, there's less work being done. But more importantly, I don't have as much garbage collection. So, which is important for these huge arrays of data that we're dealing with. So I've solved that problem. Um, less array allocation, less garbage collection, fewer iterations. Uh, but we have another problem that I need to solve. Uh, this, this, that, that little bit there was kind of my gateway drug into RxJS. The, the other issue we were, we were having that RxJS uh, is going to solve for us is, or needs to solve for us, uh, is uh, WebSocket connectivity issues. So that, that page that you saw was heavily um, oriented around WebSockets, multiplex WebSockets in particular. And what would happen is if you close the lid to your laptop or you leave and come back, or you walk between buildings, you lose Wi-Fi, or you're going over 4G and it's a sketchy connection, or the server gives out, uh, your page is going to die and it's not going to work. So basically you had to sit very, very still in order for the page to continue working. And on top of which we're multiplexing WebSockets, and that, that means what you do is you connect to a WebSocket, you send a subscription message for each data stream that you care about, you filter out that data stream, and then when you're done with that data stream, you need to send an unsubscribe message over the WebSocket, so it stops sending, the server knows to stop sending those things. And then you, when, if everything's disconnected, ideally you tear down the WebSocket so you're not utilizing server resources. So it's a little complicated, but it gets worse when you have to reconnect it. Because if, if the problem is that now my socket can randomly die, and I don't know when, uh, I need to reconnect the socket, I need to resend all the subscriptions, which means I need to maintain some sort of state about what my subscriptions are. Uh, and then I might care about whether or not I'm offline, so I know when to try to reconnect. Uh, you know, I might just try to add a delay and reconnect again. But what if my user switches views while they're disconnected? How do I know, like, now I have to remove the state of what they were subscribed to and add a new state? With imperative code, this, this gets really, really tricky and, and and kind of awful. So this is how observables are going to help. They're going to help because they're lazy. That makes sense, right? Um, the they, observables can execute code when they're subscribed to it. They only execute code when they're subscribed to it. They don't do anything unless you subscribe to them generally. There's the idea of hot observables, but we're not really going to go over that in this talk. But observables sit and they're cold until you subscribe to them. And then they, they execute some code to do things like set up a WebSocket or what have you. Uh, and they also execute code upon disposal, so for tearing down sockets. So things you can do would be, as I stated, set up a web socket and then tear it down, send an AJAX request and then abort it, which I showed that earlier, uh, set up an event listener and then tear it down when you're done and you don't care about it anymore. So that laziness is actually what, a, what allowed FlatMap earlier to cancel my XHR in that other example. So this part is the part I care about. This is nice. So. Now I, now I have this observable that can set up a WebSocket connection underneath and then tear it down. And I can write another observable on top of that that knows to send the subscription message, right? So the other fun thing about this is because observables are lazy, they can be retried or repeated simply by subscribing them to again if they fail, okay? But even better, uh, RxJS has some operators, retry, retry when, 
and repeat that allow me to do things like retry n number of times or infinitely as soon as it fails, retry when a certain observable emits, or just repeat it if, as soon as it's done, just do it over again. So we're going to jump to a code example for this. This one gets a little bit more intense, and I, uh, I fully understand if there are a lot of questions about this one. Uh, all of this stuff is going to be up on GitHub, so you can go through. You can grok it. You can put issues on there if you have questions about what it's actually doing. But I'm going to try to go through it. <coughs> App still up. Web socket example. Is my app really still up? No. All right. So here we go. I made up. I made this app. This is real-time information about you folks here at this meetup. I got this from the NSA. It's using your smartphones. So this is, this is getting information about who people who are thinking about the talk, people that are using their phones, and people that really have to go to the bathroom. And uh, I can actually get this. this. This is just now, but I can get this real-time. And what's going to happen is when I click one of these checkboxes, it's, it's going to connect the socket and subscribe to a stream. So here's all the people real real time right now thinking about the talk. Oh my god, it's going down. <laughs> people are not thinking about this talk. <laughs> well, let's see why. Uh, oh, because they're using their phones or maybe they have to be. So you can see right now, you can see I'm, I'm showing when this is open underneath. I've got a little spinner. It says open. If I kill this, it kills the spinner next to it. So these are my individual data streams. Now the WebSocket's closed. So I've just, I'm logging these things out to console here too, so you can get an idea of what's coming in. But if I connect it, WebSocket opens, opens up again, and we're back in business. Boom. More interesting than that is I subscribe to all of these things. And then I go here, and I say, oh, let's kill this server. I don't like it. It's closed. It's not doing anything. OK, let's start it back up again. And after a delay, Maybe. <laughs> no? It's going to make a liar out of me. Ooh. Click into it to get focus. Just in case. What's happening? No. Oh. Man, so sad. Do over. Probably broke the code playing with it right before I came in here. Dude. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. So here we go. We'll see if we can find the bug. We'll, we'll see if we can find the bug. Bonus points to whoever does a bug, you can do my next talk. All right. So here's what the code looks like. So what I'm doing, the, the HTML looks like this. I've got these input, these inputs here, and they all, each one of them has a class on it. Uh, it says stream option. And uh, here is my output here. So nothing really fancy going on. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to select all of my checkboxes, and I'm going to make a stream of their change events. I'm going to filter that down to only when they're checked. So if I get past this, this is when someone's checked one of those checkboxes. And then I'm going to flatten out that into my multiplexer. Now this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. I wrote a, a library called Rx Socket Subject that we use at Netflix. It's open source. I'm going to have the link for that later. Uh, but what this is, is this wraps a web socket in what's called an Rx subject. So an Rx subject is an observer on one end and an observable on the other end. But all you really need to know is that when you next a value into the socket subject, it queues a message up to be sent. When you subscribe to the socket subject, it connects, it connects the socket and then it sends all the queued messages and then any value uh, nexted in after that will be sent over that connected uh, subject. It also has this multiplex method, and that gives me back this function that is a multiplexer. This uh, just kind of embodies the, the aspect of now I need to wrap this, this socket observable in something that gives me another observable that when I tear it down or set it up, it, it uh, knows to subscribe or unsubscribe. So when you saw me going through and, and unsubscribing or unchecking those checkboxes and then the socket closed, this is why. Um, so back in here, so I've, I've I'm looking at all my checked events. I'm mapping it into the value which contains the key right here, the, the key that uh, I need to send for my subscription to the WebSocket. And then 
that's that's actually going into the multiplexer for my subscription message. I just sent type sub the key, and for my unsubscription message, which gets sent when I dispose, it says unsub in the same key. This here is a filter that selects out the data for that stream that I care about. So it's actually just looking at the request I sent, which is this guy, versus the uh, data coming back will have the same key in it. After that, I've added this uh, retry when. Now, retry when is this, this will be hit once at the start, and it gives me a stream of errors that I can subscribe to. Now, the errors emit whenever there's an error in the preceding observable. And every whatever observable I return from this, when it emits, it's going to retry the previous observable, so my multiplexer in this case. That's what I've chained into it. So what's going to happen if I hit an error, and what should have happened if I hit an error, is it's going to say, Window Navigator, if I'm online, then I know I want to do an exponential step back. Right, so I get some delay, which is calculated here with, by in, incrementing this exponent and doing a few things. I'm going to warn this, and then right out, right here, I'm going to return this timer, which just waits a certain amount of time and then emits a value and, and, and ends. And when this timer goes off, theoretically, which didn't happen in this case, I don't know why. Are you connected to the internet? Because maybe since um, you are not, maybe. it's not handling I the window not. online. That's I am not. That could be it. Um, yeah, so it's probably hitting this and being like, sorry, you're not online, dude. Yeah. Man. Hold on real quick. Does anybody know the Wi-Fi information here? Is there just a public account? Boom. Did I just log into like some spyware thing? <laughs> so if I hit like... Sorry, Yahoo guys. <laughs> so that, that appears to be working. Yay. So yeah, I came back online and started working. Again. All right, so we know that code works. So let's go back and kill this one more time just for my own amusement. Dead. Dead. Look at that, it's retrying. Maybe. Hey! hey. And see? I just need a systems admin to follow me around and make sure I'm not doing something retarded. All right. So, and then another, a, f a few final little pieces to what, what's happening here. So, whenever you check this, whenever you check a, 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 an input, you're making this stream of, of values that's coming back from your multiplex data socket. I only want to take those until I'm, I've unchecked that checkbox. So, what I'm doing here is I'm adding take until which accepts an observable, that whenever that emits, it says, oh, kill my previous observable. And that's just from events, I find the input by the, by the value in it again, this, uh, this thing here, which I already know in my, in my data stream. I find it, I wait for it to change, and I just take one. And that's, that's how it knows to close when I uncheck my, my checkbox. Then I've got a couple of little things here where I, I'm doing a side effect where I want to show the spinner when it gets a successful message to let me know it's got data streaming into it. And when it dies for any reason, I want to hide that spinner. Right? <coughs> if I close it or there's an error that kills it. And then up here, it's the same sort of thing at a higher level. If I get a successful message at all over the socket, I'm going to reset my exponent that I was using for my exponential step back. Um, this is, I'm just logging out the values I'm, I'm getting. So you can see them over on the side. And then down here in the subscribe, I'm finally taking my key and value out of, the, out of what I'm getting back. And I'm setting the results, the, the, what you're seeing down here. So again, I understand that this is a lot to follow, but I'm trying to show you the, the power of using some of these things. If you took the comments out of this, it's really not that much code for what it's doing. And it's robust. It'll handle everything but a guy that doesn't know how to use Wi-Fi. <laughs> You know, it, it actually did handle that. As soon as I got back online, it connected, right? So, uh, it, it's it's. If you're interested in this at all, please go out, look at the code. If you can't grok it, email me. I'm happy to help anybody with this, or just ask me after the talk, and hopefully, I'll be able to answer some more questions. So, so uh, the go. until thing is that like waiting for an event and then it stops. That's that's exactly right. So it's saying I've got this observable that's emitting values. 
keep giving me these values until whatever I've passed in here, this other observable, emits something to me and then kill, the, kill my observable. Okay. Thanks. Get started again. It, it only gets started again when you check a checkbox again and it goes through this whole path. Okay. So, let me see. Get back to my talk. It's relying on the fact that you can't check a checkbox multiple times without unchecking it first. Like, you can't check a checkbox and check it again without an uncheck happening yeah, in between. If you manage to do that. Well, it, 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 the event won't fire. Like, the change event won't fire. That guy gets points. All right, so that was my code example. This incidentally is, is uh, that's, that's what we do at Netflix. <laughs> um, all right, so another point I want to make about this, and this is, this is tacked on uh, towards the end. Um, application development, even if you don't use observables or, or reactive streams, there's just, it's just not your thing, uh, because it is, there's a lot to grok. I don't remember all the operators half the time. Um, and it's a totally different way to think about things. Application development is really about data flow. <coughs> and what, do I, what I mean by that is uh, if you were to walk up to your app, whatever, whatever it may be right now, and just point at a variable in your app, anywhere at random in your code, that variable, and presuming it's not a constant, that variable is something that's going to change over time. And your code reached that point via some propagation, some path that it took, some stream of, of consciousness your application took to get to that point. So you, it's, it's, it's good to try to reason about where did your variables come from, how did you get to, to where this variable is changing, and what are you going to use it for? Uh, what are your side effects? What, are you, what state are you, are you changing that's going to affect your application? So, in my opinion, RxJS makes this a, a little easier to reason about if, you, if you're practiced at it. I mean, obviously, that, that code I showed you is probably gobbledygook to a lot of you. Um, and it would have been to me a, a few months ago, honestly. But, uh, you know, with, with practice, uh, streams development really helps with this. Uh, the, the thing that you have to do is you have to think in streams. So, again, this is, this is kind of what I was talking about. You, you look at any variable in your app and you try to think about it as what if I had a stream of this variable? How did I get a stream of this variable? Where did that come from? And all of a sudden, you start to see how data is propagating through your application or through different components, maybe just a class in your application. So here's an example of thinking in streams. So if I have a variable c, if I just randomly find this var c equals a plus b, uh, it's, it's somewhere in my app. And I wanted to, to do this with streams. It's bar C equals A plus B, then we're going to do something with, with C. We can presume that A or B changed at some point. Some event triggered the, the change to A or B. And that's why we need to, to calculate C again and do something with it. If we're going to think about this in terms of streams, what we would have to do then is get a stream of A and a stream of B and combine them into a stream of C, which is my A, a plus B up there at top. Now, to do something with C, my side effect, I can subscribe to my C stream and do something with that. Now, the interesting thing about this is here, doing something with C, even if I was to call a function and pass C to it, is, is somewhat married to my knowledge of A and B, right? Like A and B are, are be, being used to calculate C and leading into this, like a function call or some block of code here that I'm doing something with C. Here, what I'm doing with C is only really married to my stream, my C, my stream of Cs. Like, it, it doesn't care where it got the stream from. That's been decoupled. So if I wanted to get a, C of stream, uh, a stream of C from somewhere else or merge in you know, some voice to text command or something like that, I could totally do that in this scenario and it would be trivial. Here, not so much. You'd be adding a lot more imperative code and if, ifs and thens. So it's, you want to think about data flow in terms of entry and exit. Now this could be in terms of just a component that you're working on or just a class that you're working on or maybe in terms of an entire application, uh, but it's, it's a higher level concept. So, you know, common entry points for a single component might be user input, network I.O. If you're setting a property on a class, maybe that's an entry point to code flow through that class. And then exit points would be things like uh, if you're setting something in state that's shared, uh, or you're sending something off to some persistence layer, or updating the view, uh, or emitting a, an event from your component out to where other components care. So, the idea with, with uh, reactive streams programming would be to get all of these entry points 
stream them in, merge them, map them, do what you need to do, and then use things like do and subscribe to get them out. So in RxJS, observables are your sources of entry, and do and subscribe are your sources for exits. There's also do on error, do on completed, and these other things, but those are their places where you're creating side effects. Side effects being updating some state or updating some shared view or something that other code has access to. So the idea is to keep your data flow contained. Uh, think of your stream as an actual stream with banks. You want to you try to keep all of your data inside of it immutable, uh, meaning that things aren't coming from outside and changing the, the data that you're using in your stream. You don't want to inject variables into the side of your data stream and use that because it, you, while it might work or, or solve, solve some problem for you in a pinch, eventually something's going to change that variable and you're going to end up with some weird spooky results in your, in your data stream. So a recap on um, observables. Observables are any number of values over any amount of time. They're lazy, so they don't do anything until you subscribe to them, unless they're hot. That's, again, a different topic. Uh, they embody the setup and tear down of, of your underlying data source. So anything you can start or stop, you can represent with an observable. They can be retried or repeated. Uh, and you, you want to try to use do and subscribe to create side effects. And uh, observables are, are by design, uh, are, are designed to be cancelable. And this is a, a little dig because there's a lot of work going on right now trying to make promises cancelable. And uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't pan out quite as smoothly as it does with observables because they were, they were kind of designed that way. So here's some links for resources. I'm going to post these slides up. You don't have to write them all down now or anything. But uh, things like RxJS2, uh, the, the examples from this talk, uh, the socket subject that I, that I put up. Um, I am working with a team of folks on rewriting RxJS's RxJS3 to be more compliant with the CC39 spec that's also linked here. Um, so it's, it's an exciting time to be working on this stuff. Other people for you to follow, one of the people that's not on this list that I should have mentioned because he is here is uh, Martin Gontovnikas, who is in the front row. Wave your hand. Higher. 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 So he actually did a talk with me on RxJS uh, with Angular. Uh, at ng-conf, uh, so he's quite knowledgeable. Eric, Eric Meyer, he's kind of the godfather of this stuff. Uh, Jafar Hussain, who is here. I don't know where he went. I see his bag, though. Um, Matt Pabasaki, who uh, is the main author of the current version of, of RxJS, RxJS2. And uh, Jeff Cross, who is here, he, he works with RxJS a lot. Uh, he's an Angular core team member. Um, if any of you are into Java, uh, Ben Christensen, who I work with, is another good uh, person to follow. So, questions, comments? Tell me why I'm wrong. Uh, how is this different from BaconJS? It's different from, it's, it's not terribly different from, so there's BaconJS, there's Most, and there's Highlands.js. They're all reactive streaming libraries. Uh, the, one of the major things that makes RxJS different from BaconJS is one, it's a little bit closer to the TC39 spec that's up. Uh, two, it also has uh, this, the idea of scheduling or schedulers, which I didn't get into in this talk. But what schedulers can do is you can say, I want to schedule my side effects in a particular way. So in the case of Ember, for example, I made an Ember-based scheduler that triggers Ember's run loop or does all of my side effects at just the right point in Ember's run loop to to make them successful in, in that kind of asynchronous environment. Um, it, scheduling is very important when you're dealing with things like uh, large frameworks or, or that sort of thing. To the, to the rest of us, maybe not as important. Um, 